Cleo Monago has become a force for social change, also a behavior expert in the black community. Down the street, there's a bunch of police likely surrounding a black male. It's kind of a daily thing for them to be in our community in those numbers. And from our perspective, this situation is a consequence of them not knowing how to decode at a young age. I am Dr. Cleo Monago, behavioral health specialist, and culture analyst, and I'm the guy to come to to teach black people to love themselves in their own image and to make self-love a unapologetic way of life. One of the side effects of not understanding the society we live in is that we internalize a lot of the negative messages, the negative treatment, and we implode and act out on each other, which results in police contact and excuses to destroy us or shoot us. My first experience was in Malibu. And on the way home, I was pulled over. And I remember having on a brand new outfit. And the cops who were white told me to, first of all, I didn't do anything. I was just breathing and driving. They wanted me to lay down on the ground in my, in my outfit. And I was like, why? And they called me the N-word and said, we're not going to explain nothing to you, and literally started reaching for the gun. When the Rodney King incident occurred, I was at a friend's house um, downtown Los Angeles, and we were talking to each other and watching television. And we looked at each other and said, wait a minute, this is L.A. And then we turned the volume up, and we saw that it was this young man named Rodney King being beat. What's unusual here is not him being beat, but that it's on film, and that this was not unusual. It was very impactful, and I was involved in the revolt that occurred. Um, I was at my mother's law firm, matter of fact, during one of the times that they were the people in the community, and my mother was one of the many people who put in, the, in their window black business to make sure that the people who were going off about this incident would not destroy her business, and of course they did. I imagine that if Freddie Gray, who's featured in this picture, understood critical thinking and culture affirmation and who he was in the human story as a person of African descent, he would still be alive. I understand why he ran for the police. Well, we want black people to run to each other for support and affirmation. And that's what CTCA helps us to do. Most of the murals around town are in reaction to a crisis or white supremacy assaults on black lives. But we're, there's more to us than that. And that situation could be avoided if we knew how to decode the world in which we live in right now. You have to be able to decode. Decode means recognize the negative message in the culture and see it for what it is and go, oh, I see that. I was, I was taught about with, the, with these negative messages. There's one right there. I see it. I'm not going to internalize it. I can give you one example that we use in our Watu Wajua program for children, which is a CTCA program for children. Watu Wajua means children of the sun in Swahili. We'll ask the children to bring their favorite magazines, make a list of their favorite movies, and they get to the point, the majority, there's exceptions to this. I want to make sure people know there's exceptions to what I'm getting ready to say. But in most cases, everything they bring glorifies whiteness. The cartoons they like, the Disney cartoons, the shows like Game of Thrones, etc. cetera. Um, they like this stuff. Like sometimes when the children come to our class, they talk about a movie they've gone to and, and all the black men are criminals. You know, they, they break it all down. And most of the movies about black people, even now, are centered around drug addiction or drug dealing. Like, power, it's called power, but it's about a drug dealer. He don't have no power, and he don't even have enough self-respect to be a good role model to his children, and he's a drug, but it's all fiction. You know, I, I wanna make sure we're clear, this is it's all made up, but it's made up and approved by a, a system of white supremacy that only allows certain types of films to be greenlit for us to actually experience. It says here, be more successful. And it depicts property being built and a newscaster reporting on a property being built. I can see why they would say that's powerful, but what's powerful is being able to have critical race theory or critical race fact, in my opinion, in our schools. 
There's a lot of stuff that children find out through us getting them to actually examine what they have. We don't tell people what to do. We just bring the stuff and it's already, it's already done in terms of what's in these images and in the magazines that they bring is that they're not affirmed. And one of the questions we ask the young people, what in this stuff teaches you to love yourself and that reveals your beauty and your relevance in the human story? And, 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 and typically don't find that and that's a revelation for them. When their parents are in the class, it's a revelation for them too that they didn't have enough insight to create a safety net for black love and self-love for their children. So it becomes a really good process for them. But I'm giving an example of some of the exercises that we do with adults as well to break the trance. One of the words that we use among many that are problematic is the word fair skin. The implication is that the other skin is unfair. It is unconscious. Interestingly enough, some of the, the answers to our challenges are also written here. It says, seek knowledge. It doesn't tell you what knowledge specifically to seek. I came from a dysfunctional family where I've written this abuse, um, anti-black behavior. Now, the, what I'm calling anti-black behavior, you or maybe, may, many others may not see as anti-black behavior, but it is. The N-word is anti-black behavior. There was a lot of talk around skin color, dark, light, so-called colorism and um, people treated differently in the family based on their shade. I was one of the dark kids, if you will, and I was witnessing this strange discrimination within my family. I was watching this stuff with a critical eye and I couldn't normalize it. I couldn't normalize the implications was that people who look more like me were less valuable than the people who look less like me but more closer to white. I didn't realize this relationship to whiteness until later, but I could tell that something was going on that was based on how I look. Power of the people. I think that's an interesting way of describing this mural because it doesn't depict power, it depicts victimization. It depicts defense against a group of people that's no better than we are, who are not superior to us, but the implications based on their messaging is that we are in inferior and it's a myth. One of the things that the CTCA model successfully deconstructs is the myth of white supremacy and the resulting anti-black implications that come out of it. We lived in Buffalo, New York for a short time and Buffalo, New York is very cold and all that stuff. But anyway, one day I had a friend named Michael who was white and Michael lived in the, in the next street. The reason we were friends was because we, we used to walk home in the same direction after school. One day, which was always the norm when I went to his house, I wasn't allowed in. Um, and when he came to our house, he could go to the refrigerator, you know, he could do whatever he wanted to do. That didn't become clear to my parents until I came home after a snowstorm in which I, was, I had to wait outside his house. Um, and I had my, my um, eyebrows were white and everything was white. When I walked into my family, my family could tell something was wrong. And they said, why are, you, why are you freezing like that? And I was hesitant because I could tell instinctively that something was going to happen if I told them what was going on. Like they might not let me play with Michael anymore. So I told them and they looked at each other and all they said was, you can't, you can't go over there anymore. The mistake they made and a lot of black parents do this to quote, protect their children from the wrath of racism so they won't be angry, which is a mistake, was they didn't explain anything to me. They just said, you can't go over there anymore. And I was sad because I went to play with Michael, that was my friend. But um, later, as I reflected on my development, um, I realized that a lot of parents did not explain this stuff to their children. They just said, you gotta be twice as good as a white man and all this, you gotta work twice as hard, which frankly implies that in your unconscious, it's saying you're twice as bad, so you gotta make up for it. And we have to start decoding mixed messages. Fighting for the 400th year for your rights as a human being is not powerful. The recommendations that we give, as I mentioned, um, you gotta work twice as hard as the, the, the white man. It's well intended. But it's, it's an anti-black implication because this is what should happen if we don't want to injure black self concept We'll say, you have to work really hard because there's a corruption in this culture called white supremacy and racism that's unfair and wrong. 
And you have to do what you can to make sure that you navigate past it so you can do well in a society. That's a more holistic recommendation than simply saying you got to work as hard as a white man, which is what it's usually that simple. We are taught to not value black and we look at black as a problematic way of being, a painful way of being, and we're constantly trying to compensate for that by trying to do things that are more like white people. What we need to understand is that this is not necessary and it can be reversed. And there's a behavior change model that I developed called CTCA, which stands for Critical Thinking and Culture Affirmation, which is a, um, a collection of exercises, activities, interviews, trigger questions, um, group work, and all types of different interfaces that teaches black people to come out of the trance. If you give somebody good recommendations or good advice on what they should do, if they're in a trance, they may or may not behaviorize your recommendation, even if it's the best thing for them, because they're too behaviorally disoriented or emotionally disoriented to actually do take the advice you're having, even though it's the best thing that they should get. So what I do with my work before you get to the good advice or the recommendations is break the trance. Getting out of trauma trance is a process. If I give you a great recommendation and you're in the trance, like, for example, you should love yourself. That sounds good on the surface, right? But if you haven't done the work toward loving yourself, you might go, okay, all right, I'll go do it. But you don't even know you don't like yourself. So how are you gonna go do self-love work if you don't know about the elements that have led you into questioning your worth as a black person? One of the things that being healed from trauma trans gives you the ability to do is really be in your body. Really be uh, powerful and self-loving as a way of being in this society. First, we learn the normal things in the, in the environment that implies that we're not valuable and the people who are participating in the program bring in stuff that's part of their lives. And then once they realize there's an issue based on their own recognition, we go into why, why is it like this? The bottom line is that you have to not be in the trance. That's the first thing. And you have to be able to decode all of the implications that imply that you're of lesser value. But a lot of people don't know that. And then they, then they learned about the corruption that I mentioned earlier, that was when I was a child, it would have been helpful. My parents would have told me why I couldn't play with Mike instead of saying, don't play with him anymore. They would have told me that because there's this thing called racism and white supremacy, which is wrong and corrupt. It's not you, baby. That's wrong and corrupt. I love you. It's not you. It's the society that's, that has these corruptions in it that I want you to recognize because they don't know how beautiful and how great you are, but I do, and I'm letting you know and I want you to know how to recognize the lies and the implications of the culture. So part of being out of the trance and being pro-black is to unlearn a lot of the implications. For example, when we um, hear the terms pro-black, we go right to anti-white. Like we, the opposite of pro-black is anti-white. No, the opposite of pro-black is anti-black. Either pro-abortion or anti-abortion, not pro-abortion or anti-chicken. Liberation looks like self-love. Liberation looks like being able to codify or decode the implications in the culture and the languages in the culture that implies that something is wrong with you. To help us know where our history and where we came from and to be successful on a holistic basis as opposed to how this depicts us. All these are white supremacist systems. Liberation means that you have the capacity without question and without second guessing to love yourself in your own image and walk with both feet solid and be very comfortable in that. Black people need to see black people loving each other as part of how we see the world because that would teach us and role model us the value of loving each other. It's very difficult to find a black love story that's not a comedy in popular culture. When you are clear and you're out of the trance, you're liberated from that, and your life will be liberated, but not without challenge. Being pro-black in an anti-black society is not a free ride.